Hello. This video is about a piece of legislation called the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010. Specifically, it is about part one of that act, which for the first time placed the civil service on a statutory footing. It used to be that the power to manage the civil service derived from the royal prerogative. In law, at common law, civil servants were employed at Her Majesty's pleasure, and as such could be dismissed at will. By convention, ministers would not involve themselves in the hiring or firing of civil servants, but there was nothing in law to prevent them from doing this. Part 1 of the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act changed that. It arose out of Prime Minister Gordon Brown's ambition to modernise the way the country was governed. The Act lays down in statute the principle of appointment to the civil service on merit on the basis of fair and open competition, and it places an obligation on the Minister for the Civil Service, that's one of the roles held by the Prime Minister, to publish a code of conduct for the civil service. And that code, the Civil Service Code as it is known, forms part of the terms and conditions of civil servants. These matters are now overseen by a statutory body, the Civil Service Commission. The Constitutional Reform and Governance Act is not the sort of legislation which sets out lawyers' law. That is, it is not the sort of legislation that will give rise to questions of statutory interpretation to be decided in landmark cases before the appellate courts. What it does is provide a legislative basis for long-standing civil service practice and custom. So rather than expound in detail on the provisions of the Act section by section, I talked to someone I know who has spent a career in the civil service and is steeped in its practice and custom. Martin Stanley is a retired senior civil servant, a former principal private secretary. He has also been involved in the world of postal services regulation, which is the context in which I was first introduced to him. I began by asking him to explain the concept of appointment on merit. So hello, Martin, and thank you for agreeing to speak to the students at the University of Sussex. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act of 2010. Um, now, part one deals with the civil service and core to all of that is the idea of selection to the civil service and the idea that the selection must be on the ba on merit on the basis of fair and open competition so could you explain to us what this principle of merit or merit recruitment in the civil service means i think it's it's pr pretty much what it says on the can um that you want to appoint the best person for the job um it's it's its background is that our predecessors wanted to get rid of cronyism, nepotism, appointing your family, appointing your mates to the jobs, which was the way the civil service was in the in earlier centuries. Um, but these days, I think it's it's a pretty straightforward concept. You, if you're going to, if you yourself are going to perform well, you want people who are working for you and with you also to be the best. Uh, and at that level, it's a fairly simple, straightforward uh, concept. Well, you see, it's it's what it says on the tin, which in one sense, of course, it is. But, you know, the best um, leaves open a whole uh, set of um, ideas about what is the best. Um, how is this interpreted in practice? I think in, in most cases, it is simply that you have in your mind, as a, as a civil servant seeking to appoint a new official to work for you, um, you have in mind uh, the, a job description, a set of objectives, aims, um, also a culture into which they're going to fit. Um, and you simply want the, the, the best fit, the person that's going to perform most effectively in that culture. And of course, the word culture, arises, you know, 
opens up a significant further questions which you'll no doubt raise but uh, at the game at that level you have a you have a concept which is i have a job here needing to be done i have an organization within which the job needs to be done let's find the best person for it so one one way in which these cultural factors might come into play i can think of an example um when Theresa May became Prime Minister, she was insistent that she needed to have a Brexiter, someone who believed in Brexit, leading EU negotiations. And, you know, that raises some questions about, you know, is the best person, is this defined purely in terms of competence, experience, and so on, or does it involve some aspect of commitment to the government's policies? I think whether it's working for a minister or working for an official, you do want somebody that you think can be reasonably enthusiastic about doing the job well. Um, and some jobs, are, it's easy enough to be to be enthusiastic. Uh, uh, that particular job, obviously, some people would find it rather difficult. However clever they were, however well experienced they were, they may feel so strongly uh, about the subject. Um, that they would find genuinely find it difficult to do the job well, not 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 wanting to hold it up, not 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 wanting to misbehave in any way, um, but simply just finding it very difficult to come into work every day. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think merit equals ability to do that particular job, which requires certain skills or a certain approach or a certain mindset. So it sounds like you are saying that merit is. Um, a sufficiently open-ended or open-textured concept that it can capture aspects of competence, ability, intelligence, diligence, but it can also uh, capture aspects of commitment to the government's agenda. A commitment to doing that particular job well, yes. I mean, a, a lot of civil service jobs, of course, I mean, never most civil servants never get anywhere near ministers. And you're simply you're, you're simply looking to appoint people who um, will work in a tax office effectively, um, will work will be a driving test examiner. The characters that would do those two jobs are probably slightly different. Yeah, yeah. Both equally merited, but they won't they won't be the same. Somebody that's going to work in a team. Um, might require a different personality to somebody that's going to be uh, uh, sitting on their own in a room analysing stuff. It doesn't mean you're not choosing on merit, you're, but what you're not doing, I mean, the, I think, you know, the best way to approach this is the way I began. You're looking for somebody that can do the job really well, but you are not allowed, even if you think they are the best, you're not allowed simply to appoint your brother or your best friend. And we have a we have a statutory body now, the Civil Service Commission. Uh, the Civil Service Commission has various roles in enforcing the Civil Service Code, which I'll come to, but also in relation to ensuring uh, recruitment the, the merit recruitment principle is abided by. What kind of role does it actually play here in terms of practicalities? Well, again, for most civil service appointments, it has its its practical influence is simply to have a code, have a have guidance material which departments follow. The civil service commission itself, I don't know how many people it employs, but it's a it's a fairly small number. So their main job is simply to to be there as a, as, a, as an advisor in the background. Now they do get involved in various ways in the most senior appointments. Um, getting making sure that there, there's a good process and actually sitting on boards for the for the very most senior appointments um but on the whole their job is in the in the background uh just to make sure the system is is, is policed properly yeah I, I can't resist at this point uh, just uh, bringing into conversation my experience as an academic researcher of jamaica where the Public Service Commission has been, well, first of all, it's a constitutional body. It's, it, it, its position is established by the con Constitution. And where it has at times been seen as an actual obstacle to governments appointing people that they felt were sufficiently committed to their agenda, 
presumably you don't suppose that the Civil Service Commission this in, in, in here plays any similar role. I don't think so. Not 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 like that. No. Um, interestingly, I also worked in the Caribbean for, a, uh, for for twice each time for five or six months, and and we had uh, in the we had a, a, a something similar, a public services commission, whatever. And uh, I think its role was very different to to the uh, to the role of the civil service commission here. Well, I will I will resist the temptation to talk about your particular roles in the Caribbean, which are mm. very interesting to me. Um, but I will, staying on that side of, Atlant of the Atlantic, um, ask you a little bit about, you know, how, you know, on the one hand, selection on merit seems obvious and, you know, who could disagree with that? But of course, it's not a core principle of the US civil service. And, um, at the moment, um, President-elect Biden, as we speak, is making appointments to executive office and he is guided by slightly different principles. Do you think that could uh, be a, an approach that we could adopt here to some extent? Well, again, you've got to distinguish the vast majority within the United States civil service. I, I absolutely don't know if it's true, but I suspect that they have very similar merit rules. I suspect that to become a, an official in the, in the middle of one of their large federal agencies or, or one of their state agencies, I suspect you've, got, you've pretty much generally got to be appointed on merit, unless you're one of those that have to be elected, which some, which some of them do. Um, again, it's, what you're talking about is that very small group of officials, or in the, in the case of the states, non-officials, who work at the very highest levels uh, and have a lot of contact with the president, or in our case, cabinet ministers, and their their system is totally different to ours. Of course, they um, the whole of their most senior civil service changes when a president changes, whereas ours doesn't. And frankly, if I were a minister, I could well see the advantages and the merits and the benefits of, of their system. I think it must be pretty difficult sort of verging on appalling to be a, a minister that's been in opposition for some some years built up a lot of expertise in some subjects lots of mates policy advisors think tanks around you uh, encouraging you helping you develop your ideas wow you win the election you walk into one of those big offices on victoria street or whitehall and they are not allowed in the front door you get to take in with you two special advisors. And apart from that, you've got to work with Sir somebody or Lady somebody and a team of officials who, by the way, until five minutes ago, were working for your political opponents. It must be pretty difficult. Well, and, like yet, and yet you can see the advantages of it in yeah. that you've immediately got expertise, Etc. 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 Well, you say five minutes ago. It's not quite five minutes, but you know, we always have our elections on Thursday. The yeah. new prime minister chooses his or her ministers, secretaries of state, and so on on the Friday, and they start work on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. That presumably is the, the 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 advantage of our system. Um, I, I can imagine President-elect Biden maybe wishes he had that as well. Oh, absolutely. Well, it, I, I said, yeah, five minutes, obviously an exaggeration, but actually you meet your permanent secretary and, and I was a principal private secretary. So the a cabinet minister's personal sort of uh, private secretary. Um, and, you, you know, as soon as you know who it is, you're on the phone to them and you're arranging to meet that evening. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty abrupt, pretty abrupt changeover. Um, changing tack just slightly i mean um I, i'd like to talk a bit about the civil service code that is one of the other innovations of um the constitutional reform and governance act section five requires the minister of the civil service uh to publish a code of conduct for the civil service and so what is the civil service code and how does it govern the working lives of civil servants well, again, it's a, it's a it's a document which was written many moons ago. Does, it hasn't changed much over the years, I don't think. Um, so it's got your key 
key elements that civil servants are required to be impartial, um, act with integrity, be honest. And there's a fourth be one, activity. let me be objective. <laughs> I wrote them down beforehand, I knew you'd ask. But the fact that I had to write them down says something quite deep about the code. Actually, most people never read it. It's there, if you like, as, a, as, as an expression of something that's quite sort of fundamental to, in the culture of the civil service. The minute you arrive, you arrive in an organisation that tries to take decisions sensibly and fairly and tries to behave properly. Um, the code itself, it's a bit like, you know, the highway code which, you know, of course, we're all forced to read before passing a driving test, but you never read it again. It's just something that's, it's very important. It's there as a reference, as a reference, it's now law, which it didn't used to be, but um, it's, hopefully you never have to read the detail. So it's something you live and act out rather than something you read. Absolutely. Which brings us to, something I, I'd like to touch on. Um, um, we're recording this the week in which the, the Prime Minister's independent advisor on ministerial interests has um, issued a, or, pub, or has had his report published into accusations of bullying by a minister, Priti Patel. Mm -hmm. um, from the civil service point of view, um, how how would a civil servant who most wanted to live up to the values of the civil service code and the civil service ethos more generally how how should a a, 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 a diligent civil servant behave facing or witnessing accusations of bullying like that um well I, I, let, let's talk from the point of view of somebody witnessing bullying and it's i wouldn't say it's common but in a, in a, in a in a longish career in the senior levels of the civil service you will from time to time see ministers get very angry very upset because they are in very stressed situations um and they're being pulled in all sorts of directions and for various reasons they find the constraints on their behavior all sorts of constraints, political and, and legal and so on, to be extremely irritating. So there's there's a very there's a there's a dividing line between accepting that ministers will get upset, will get angry, will swear, and will sometimes say things they shouldn't, and feeling that it's gone so far as us to amount to bullying. The first thing, you know, ideally is if a minister and a particular official are not getting on is to try and separate them. Um, I remember again when I was principal private secretary, um, we had a very good private secretary working for one of the junior ministers. Um, and come the reshuffle, we got uh, uh, this private secretary was asked to report to a different minister. Um, and this new minister was a great character. One that I really you know, f fun guy, but very, very different to his predecessor. And the civil servant was fairly serious and sombre sort of type. And after two or three days, the minister came to see me and he said, I just can't stand working with this job. I just, you know, the, the test is often, you know, could, could I imagine doing a long plane trip sitting next to this person? And he said, I just can't, you know, no, he's driving up the wall. So you you move the you move the private secretary on. You you don't blame the minister for that. Um, some ministers, uh, so and some ministers find the approach, the style of other of civil servants to be irritating. If possible, you you try and get them to 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 live with it. But sometimes not possible, and you you try and move people on. It's gone very very badly wrong if it gets to the stage of a minister being accused of bullying. Um, and I, I, I do find it very difficult to imagine how, quite how we got there. But to bring this right back to where we started and what is the characteristic of uh, merit, uh, perhaps you're saying that merit ultimately means the ability to get on and serve the minister. 
if you work if you're working closely with a minister or frequently with a minister, absolutely right. Um, I mean, I you know I was I was sacked once by a minister who just didn't like me, didn't like him either very much. It was probably a good thing we parted. This is this is life. It happens in every. It happens. I'm sure it happens in universities. I'm sure it happens in. It certainly happens in the private sector and it happens in the civil service. The important thing is to try to find a way of meeting the minister's needs without compromising the essential objectivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, tests. And it's, in my experience, almost always possible to do that. You sometimes think the minister's big really really being unreasonable but hey they're the boss okay i've got one last question for you and it's the question i put to jack simpson caird who's uh, assistant counsel to a select committee mm -hmm. so the question is what's the one thing that you would want law students to know about your role that they couldn't read in a textbook <laughs> the civil service <laughs> civil service the um, it's a very good question. I you could it depends on the textbook. I I suspect. I think actually quite a lot has been written about the role of the civil service. Um, I think it's fun, actually. That's a, I'm sorry if that's a slightly strange answer, but most officials really really enjoy their jobs even when you're faced with demanding ministers even when you think they're doing the most stupid thing actually trying to survive and make progress uh it is a it is a su surprisingly um uh, exciting and and fun career from time to time it can be very boring from time to time but uh, on the whole it's unpredictable and fun well, what a splendid note to finish on, that it is fun being a civil servant. I am not sure that everyone would find it to be so. But if you think a career in the civil service might be fun and rewarding for you, you may be interested to know that Martin has written a book, How to Be a Civil Servant, published in 2016 by Politicals. He also maintains a really useful website, civilservant.org.uk. Martin told me that his website materials had their origins in materials that he had put together to advise ministers on the role of the civil service. And he commends it as being a bit more forthcoming than the official materials describing the civil service. I recommend it as an interesting collection of ideas, doctrines and statistics on the civil service. A real treasure trove, in fact, so check it out. But that's it for me on the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, and I'll see you in a later video.